And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right, so this week on the podcast, we've got Bo Burlingham. Uh, Bo is an author of six different books, has been a writer for Inc. Magazine, Forbes. Uh, he is a great storyteller and has been around the block and had many different experiences I'm excited to hear from today. Um, Bo, can you just give us a little bit more background on your history? I'm, I'm sure I didn't cover it all. Well, um, my history <laughs> is a complicated history, but uh, as as far as uh, I, uh, in my youth, was a, a radical fellow. Um, it was a crazy time in this country, and I was sort of totally caught up in that. And uh, I was... Uh, you know, I, I was I was pretty far out there on the left, and uh, I regarded myself as a communist, small t- c, um, and uh, I had all kinds of things that I believed, and I thought, th- and I read a lot of the of the literature of the time, and uh, um, I thought I was pretty smart. Um, so, in any event. I um I started I at a certain point I um when I um I I got to a point where um well I I met my wife and and we got married and uh we had a child and uh I needed to get a real job and uh, uh well I needed to get a job and uh I wound up going to work for uh, a. It wasn't really an underground paper. It was a, but it was a, a small paper, newspaper in um, in Boston, uh, called at the time it was called the Phoenix. Um, it went through many changes after that, but so I, I worked there for a little while, and. Uh, and then I went to work for another one of these papers that is sort of like the Village Voice, uh, uh, in also in Boston called Boston After Dark. And while I was there, I got recruited to um, go to California and become an editor of a magazine called Ramparts, which was a, a well-known left-wing magazine back in the nineteen. Uh, 19- 60s and early 70s, you know, it was sort of the magazine that print Che Guevara's diary and uh, did all kinds of uh, exposés and things like that. So in any event, I, I was, I, that was my introduction to, to writing. And for the next few years, that's what I was doing. I was writing and that sort of thing. And then, but, you know, it was all pretty much freelance. Um you know, freelance writing is feast or famine, mainly famine. And uh, um, at a certain point, we had another child, and uh, I had to really get a real job at that point. And uh, I was um, uh, got a call from a headhunter who had been uh, referred to me by a friend of mine and knew that who knew that I was looking around for something, and she'd been hired by Fidelity Investments to uh, find a writer, and I said, well, you know, um, I'm flattered, but uh, I, I'm sure they don't want me. I, I said, I, I don't know the difference between a stock and a bond. Um, and she said, no, 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 that's not a problem. They'll teach you all that. They just want somebody who can sort of put words and sentences together. And I said, well, okay, I'll do that. I'll go talk to them. So I went and talked to them. And uh, for whatever reason, they decided to hire me. And uh, so I went to work at Fidelity Investments. Now, you have to understand Fidelity Investments is was uh, it was a sort of a rising power in in the financial services industry at that point. It was this was the early 1980s, and it had gone from being sort of a boutique firm 
to to growing quite rapidly, mainly because of money market funds. Um, uh, you know, people discovered that they couldn't make money in in their um, savings accounts. They might as well go into a money market fund, and uh, so there was just money pouring into them. But Fidelity had all kinds of other funds as well. It had all kinds of mutual funds. It was mainly noted for its mutual funds. It also had a uh, a discount brokerage. Um, so in any event, I started to go to work there. And, uh, you know, my job was to write speeches and to write brochures and things like that. Um, and uh, I it was very educational for me. I mean, I had to learn a lot in a fairly short period of time, but they were they were very good about um, helping me to get through that and to teaching me what I needed to know. Um, and one of the things that happened, that was sort of my introduction to the business world, really. And uh, one of the things that happened was that I, as I got to know the people and as I got to know the company, I began to realize that a lot of the things that I had believed about business just weren't true. Um, in fact, I would read articles in The Nation or other left-wing magazines, uh, Mother Jones, places like that, uh, about the financial services industry. And uh, I said, no, 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 that's not true. That's not what happens. It was a little bit like reading my old FBI reports, uh, where the FBI would uh, write about me and my friends and the the bad things that we were up to, they get a lot of the facts right, but they had no idea how it fit together. Um, and so they, they didn't really understand what was going on. Well, that was what, what I felt when I read about uh, lefties uh, writing about the financial services industry. So I was at Fidelity for a year, and I learned an awful lot. And uh, I got a call from a friend of mine who had been at Boston Magazine, and he had just signed up with a new startup in Boston called Inc. Magazine. And uh, Inc. was really a startup. It was uh, uh, three years old, and uh, they were hiring, and they were looking for writers who had a background in general interest magazine writing, which I did, um, but who knew something about business. Well, I'd been at Fidelity for a year, so they figured I, I knew something about business. And uh, they wound up offering me a job as well. So I went to work at Inc. Magazine in January of 1983. And it was a really interesting period. I mean, this was my introduction to entrepreneurship. I mean, there was, you're, you guys are probably too young to remember it. But there was a time when it was not a compliment to call somebody an entrepreneur. It was a put down. It was like, oh, Entrepreneurs are people who can't get real jobs. You tell your, you tell your parents that you're going to start a business and they'd, they'd say, oh, you're going to throw away your education like that? Um, and it, w it was just not something that uh, respectable people did. Um, that was beginning to change in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. And I like to think that Inc. Magazine had something to do with it. Um, and, you know, Ronald Reagan had something to do with it as well because he was a big fan of entrepreneurship and talked about it, though I doubt many people knew what he was talking about. But the main reason that the whole, uh, the whole um, way that entrepreneurship was perceived was changing was because of the people who were starting these companies. And... Um, and the companies themselves. And I was lucky to be in a situation where I um, could get to know a lot of these people and their companies when they were still pretty young. So I, you know, I'm mean, talking about Steve Jobs at Apple, Steve Wozniak at Apple, and Bill Gates and um, at uh, at Microsoft and uh, Yvonne Schoenard at Patagonia and. Uh, Ben & Jerry at Ben & Jerry's. These were all new companies back then. Um, and uh, 
I and I, it for me it was like a whole new world. It was like it challenged everything that I had believed before. Uh, I found that these entrepreneurs, almost on all of them, were very uh, incredibly idealistic people. That's why they started their company. They had an idea that they could create something that didn't exist yet. Um, and uh, I also found that a lot of them um, were um, implementing uh, the, the way they ran their companies was extremely innovative and extremely, um, well, I hate to use the word progressive because it's sort of taken on a different meaning, but it was, uh, it was, they, they were, they were very, uh, beholden and, uh, really worked very closely with their, uh, with their employees. And some of the, some of them were, in fact, they had shared ownership with their employees. And uh, do you think so that? I, just quick, wanted to yeah. ask a question there. In that, so do you think that maybe one of the things that's different about entrepreneurs is, you know, they're frustrated with something, or a lot a lot of times they're frustrated with something, and so they want to do something different, maybe around a purpose, maybe the way they run their companies, but it's born out of frustration or things they've been a part of in the past that you know they didn't like the way that the way that they worked. Yeah, well, I I think that's very common. Uh, I mean, there's some people who who just can't work for somebody else, um, and uh, uh, they aren't they turn out and they, and they do get frustrated, and uh, they can't have things go the way or they see mistakes. They see a company that they're working for making making doing things wrong, and being unwilling to change. Or um, they discover something in, in a place where they're working and they realize that, that, in fact, there's a whole business that if you were to break that part off, you'd, you could have a whole business. Um, you know, and then there are people like uh, Jobs, who um, was drawn to the tech, new technology that was coming out then uh, and who was excited by it. And uh, I mean, I did get a chance to interview jobs um actually it was in 1989 and uh and you know he it was during his period when he was at next when he was uh sort of in the wilderness um after he'd been kicked out of apple and before he he was brought back to save it um and you know it was like talking to somebody he it was like he you were talking to it was like talking to Beethoven or something like that, where he had this vision. He knew he he could look at the future and he could see what was going on, even though he couldn't completely describe it. Um, and um, so, you know, there are people like I mean, I, I mean, believe me, I've I've in the last whatever it's been forty years or so, I've met thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs and i do have a sense about how the diversity in that group and the and the different things that impel people to to go out and take the risk of starting a business you know and everybody takes a risk um you um you know you're you're taking a chance that you can create something that other people will be willing to pay for. And not only that they will they be willing to pay for it, they'll be willing to pay you more than it costs you to create it. In other words, that's what profit is. And, uh, um, and in order for you to survive, you have to have that. You have to have people who are willing to pay you, who like your products or like your services so much that they're willing to pay you more than you actually spent in creating whatever the product or service is. And, um, you know, in the beginning, that's a guess. You know, you hope you're going to do that. Uh, you know, different people have different levels of confidence about their ability to do that. But uh, um, you've, you've got to believe that you can do that or, or you're crazy to go forward. Uh, you might as well get a job with somebody else. Um, 
So in any event, this was just an incredibly that that though that period of the 1980s was just incredibly educational for me. And you know, one of the companies that I met was this company in a little company in Springfield, Missouri, um, that was doing things that, frankly, most other businesses would consider totally insane. Namely, they were actually educating, uh, they, they were sharing their financial statements with everybody in the com- company, and not only were they doing that, they were teaching them how to how to read them and how to use them. They had a whole system that they had set up that they called the great game of business. And uh, um, and it was working. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, the guy the guy who was leading it was a young guy younger than me named Jack Stack, and uh, he had uh, come up with this idea that this was the this was the best way for him to run the company or for for the company to work, and. Uh, and 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 it was going very well um and um uh, we wound up writing an article about it in ink magazine in the mid 1980s and then a couple of years later i was sort of wondering what had happened to them and i called up jack stack and that led us to do to let us to know him more and uh i wound up doing a an interview with him, which became a cover story in the magazine um, called "Why I Hate Being the Boss," and 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 that was him. He hated being the boss. And I, you know, the answer was, I asked him why. He said, "Well, because uh, of all the responsibility. Everybody's looking at me to do things, and I'm I'm being asked to do things I don't know how to do." Um, and that that had been part of his impulse in terms of creating this system. So in any event, um, uh, I there, there was a we, we had these events, these Inc. 500 events, where we would get we we did this list called the Inc. 500, which were the fastest hundred fast five hundred fastest growing private companies in America, and then we'd have a big conference for them. So at one of these conferences. Uh, I invited uh, Jack to come and speak at the conference, and uh, he did. And uh, it, it it was it was one of those. It was a breakout session at the conference, but and it was sort of started with about the room not quite full, and by the end there were people coming in looking, and and the uh, the, the, the crowd was spread out into the hallway. Um, and uh, uh, of course, most people did think he was crazy, and, and what he was talking about was absolutely nuts. Um, what's more, they'd been told by their accountants and their lawyers that it was absolutely nuts. So I invited him to have lunch with the editorial staff, and uh, we were sitting at the table, and there was actually a publisher sitting with us, and uh, I got to talking to Jack, and I I, I told him that I really loved the story we had done about him, that we got this huge response to it, and I asked him if he'd gotten a response to it, and he said, oh, yeah. he had. They, they started to have tons of people showing up at their meetings wanting to see if this thing really worked, and he got invited to go to London. Uh, he didn't go to speak to Parliament, and uh, I said, well, I, I, really, I really thought that that was a... A great story, and the publisher turned to me and said, "Well, then, why don't you write the book?" And I said, "Well, I, at that time, I was executive editor of Inc." And I said, "Well, I do have this other job, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought about it, and actually, the editor in chief, who's a good friend of mine, he said, uh, he said, he, he, when I talked to him about it, he he said, you know, you you seem really." engaged by this he said i think you should do it and so i began to take it seriously and i wound up um going from being executive editor 
to being something else. They didn't have a name for it. So they, they said, well, we'll call you the editor at large. I said, that's great. I'll be editor at large. And uh, so I, I became the editor at large, but I spent a lot of my time then in Springfield, Missouri, uh, observing what was going on there and seeing what they were doing and how they were doing it. And, you know, one thing led to another, and um, Jack and I wound up writing a book together. I mean, I wound up writing the book, but the ideas in it are all Jack's, and the stories in it are all Jack's. Uh, My job was to take all of that and to turn it into a form where it was accessible to other people. So we came out with this book uh, called The Great Game of Business, and... uh, that was really by then when 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 we had originally written about the great game of business it was this this totally unique thing that this one little company in Springfield Missouri was uh, was doing but then one of our writers John Case uh began to hear about other companies who were doing something similar so he went he said he'd like to do an article about the companies that were doing things similar to SRC and uh, we said, okay, go ahead, go do it. And he went out and he did his research and he came back and he, he said, well, I, I think if I'm going to write about this, I need to give it a name. We said, okay, that's a good idea. What name do you think you should give it? He said, well, I'm calling this open book management. In other words, where you basically open the books to your employees. And, I, and we said, okay, that sounds great. So... Actually, the great game of business happened before open book management. Yeah, and th- <laughs> and people call Jack like the father of open book management, don't they? Like, but he well, doesn't he, like he, it. He, he was definitely the pioneer. Um, uh, he, th- there's a problem. The the problem with the phrase open book management is that you say it and everybody thinks they know what it means. Okay, yeah, sure. So you tell somebody uh, who has a company and uh, they don't they don't hide their numbers from their employees and and you ask them if they're open book management they say oh yeah we're open book um but in fact uh you know just being having the books open is not doesn't begin to do what you can do with uh with this tool um and so i prefer to stick with the great game of business because the great game of business is really a whole system that uses open book management, but it's not the only part of it. Um, there's a, there, there are all kinds of other parts of it, like uh, there's the whole way it's set up, there's the bonus programs, there's what we call forward forecasting, which is when people actually um, project what the performance of their department is going to be for that month. There's a plan. They've come up with a plan to begin with in the year, and and it's a monthly plan. And then they have these meetings every week, and every week the people in the meetings uh, say, well, this is where I think we're actually going to be at the end of the month. And so they get all that information, and then all the people who are in that meeting take that information and go back to the shop floor and talk to people there and say, well, this is the way it looks. And um, if we if we do this, um, you know, we have to, they, they'll say, you know, well, we have to improve this if we're going to hit our goal. And, and because, and it's important to hit the goal because the whole, uh, aside from the fact that it's going to make the company stronger, it, there's a whole bonus system that's uh, attached to this uh, where, um, you know, it's set up at the beginning of the year so that if you hit your goals during the course of the year, there will be enough profit there that half of that profit you can uh, actually split with all the employees. The other half goes back into the company, um, you know, to buy the things that need to be bought. But so everyone is aware of this, uh, that that of this bonus program 
and whether or not and and it, and it gets into quite a lot of money. It, it, you know, it can get get into several thousand dollars a year, um, and it, it's set up in a way so that it is like a game. I mean, in the first quarter, if you have a whole bonus pool, in the first quarter, you're going for um, a quarter of the bonus. In the second quarter, you're going for half the bonus. <laughs> The first quarter, if you don't make the first quarter, it gets rolled over into the second quarter. And then the second quarter, you're going to the, um, you know, to half the bonus. And then it goes like that until at the end, in the fourth quarter, you're you're going for the whole uh, pot. And um, people, you know, obviously pay attention to that because it's a significant part of, of their uh, salary. Does the bonus pool increase as the revenues increase? So if they hit h- higher than targets, and then does that bucket get bigger for everybody? Uh, well, the in in their in their line of business, the 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 bonus pool really they start with the uh, plan for the year, which is an ambitious plan. Um, it involves growth and it involves growth that everybody has been involved in putting together this growth plan for the year. Um, if, if they achieve the growth plan and they do even better than the growth plan, then they get the bonus. Do the, if they, if they go so far over the boat, over the over the growth plan that um there's even more money than they expected um you know they're going to they're going to divide up what they have um the whole point is that everybody you know think about this jeff what is a business a business is a group of people who are working together to create something that other people want. Mm-hmm. And um, the idea that you have sort of three or four people at the top of an organization who actually know what's going on and the other 97 people or whatever it is are sort of waiting to be told what to do it's sort of crazy, actually. That's that was just that that was Jack's way of looking at it. He, he said, "You know, why are you wasting all these brains?" Uh, um, and his idea was that you that if you have um, if you have an organization where, in fact, let's say a hundred people, let's say all hundred people sort of know what's going on and are thinking about the best way to do it and are making decisions in their own what part of the business that are geared toward making the business more successful. You know, if you take two companies side by side and in one of them they've got five people who are doing all the thinking and the other one they've got a hundred people doing all the thinking, who's going to be more successful? And that is in fact what all of the companies that have adopted the great game of business have found. Um, they have found that that there not only does the culture get better because it does. I mean, it establishes this incredible level of trust um, among everybody. Um, but um, and, and respect, make, yeah. trust, trust, and respect, which are are the the two key ingredients of of a good culture, mutual mm-hmm. trust and respect. And I think a lot of times, you know, the thoughts that people put in, that they're thinking that if when they don't have the transparency of what the financials look like and what the business looks like, are magnitudes different than what the reality is, either worse or better. Usually, and, usually, usually, it's wildly exaggerated. Most people don't know the difference between sales and profit. If, if a company is selling uh, lots of stuff, 
they think that the owner must be getting really rich because of all this stuff that we're selling. Um, and so the, the most companies, when they adopt this, the first thing they have to do is to make people understand what exactly it takes to run a business and how much is, if you're lucky, how much is left over. Um, and, uh, which is very often a revelation to everybody in the company. Um, the other thing people don't understand is where is, and this is where the empl- the ownership part comes in, which is that where does the value, how does the value of that company get created? And um, that is, you know, part of the, uh, education that goes on. Now, Jack, you know, and his partners who started SRC or who bought it rather from International Harvester, which it started out as uh, being a part of, uh, they resolved at the beginning that they were going to bring everybody else in as owners. Um, just because they they thought that it was the right way to do things. And that um, they wanted that kind of buy-in from the people who worked in the company. Of course, at first, when you give people stock, they have no idea what it means. Uh, And a lot of times they just don't believe it's worth anything. Um, And it, it it takes some time and education for them to realize that this ownership share that they have, whether it's through an ESOP or some other way, ESOP is an employee stock ownership program, which is a legal entity in in the United States, um, that um, uh, they they don't, yeah, they don't understand that what it's worth. They probably have to see it, you know, like you probably got to see somebody cash out and be like, oh, this is how they get their money and this is how much it was worth. Well, Before they if, actually probably believe it, you know, a lot of times. That it's very true. I mean, there's uh, one of the people who I wrote about in Finish Big uh, was um, uh, when he got ready to sell his business. He he his advisor he got an offer for his business, and his advisor said, "Well, I don't think you should take this offer. I think you should." Uh, work on your business, and I think you can get a lot more for it. And one of the things that he did was that he set up—he didn't—he didn't share ownership, but he did set up a program so that if, when the company was sold, all the employees were going to get a piece of it. Well, the employees had no idea what this, what that was. And they probably thought it was a trick of some sort. Um, and. Uh, you know, the, he went about, he changed the way the company was run, and he he he, uh, he didn't go as far as, as Jack Stack did, but he did a lot of uh, uh, smart things to get everybody involved in the whole thing. And when he did sell it, he wound up selling it for four times what that original uh, offer had been. And... When he handed out the money, people were shocked. It's like, you know, what's this? I said, well, remember I told you that you were gonna, that you were getting these shares, and uh, and and they were just, you know, they were taken aback. Uh, you know, some of them weren't. You know, these were not wealthy people. This this was uh, some of them were. Uh, you know, there were some Mexicans in the uh, who, who bought houses for their parents uh, based on uh, what they had earned uh, and there's stories like that all over the place i mean you you do see that you know when it when it happens I, I mean at a certain point you know obviously one of the things that jack stack had to do was to try and educate people about this, you know the the increasing value of the stock and that that's exactly what we're doing here we're trying to cre- to create more value and eventually, he got through to some people, and one of the people said, "Well, 
and he talked about how you know you put the profits and you put it back into whatever they needed to crankshafts or uh, equipment or whatever, so that you can keep building the company. And um, one of the people early on sort of raised his hand and said, "Well, Jack, um, we're all here about the same age. They were all in their." 30s or 40s, and we're all about the same age, and we're all probably going to be leaving around the same time. How are you going to pay us uh, with for this stock? I mean, we can't eat crankshafts. Uh, and uh, and Jack said, "Oh, gee, well, that's a really good question," and it, it set him on a whole path where he really had to find the answer to that question, which is how is he going to pay people when they leave, which is a big issue that when you talk about employee ownership, most people uh, brush over that. They don't, they, you know, they, they, there is an obligation that is required. You have to have, you have to have a way to, to come up with a cash that when people leave, the company can buy their stock back. And, um, Jack came up with his own way to do it. Actually, if you look at uh, the second book I wrote with uh, Jack called The Stake and the Outcome, um, that really addresses how he went about uh, trying to um, how, he, how he went about making sure that the company had the wherewithal to um, take care of everybody when they left um you know and he's very he's very good with that because he one of the things they've been in business long enough so that they realize they came to realize that just about every, once every 10 years there was a big recession um and that the recession they were born during a recession and then there was another recession uh right around the late in there well i guess it would have been in like 92 or so 91 92 when clinton got elected actually and uh, and then you know there was another recession around 2000 uh and and then we all know about 2008 and what was happening there and th they realized you know a recession can be a horrible thing for a company if it's not prepared. If it is prepared, a recession is a tremendous opportunity. Why? Because everything suddenly gets cheaper. And if you like want to buy a company or something like that, and you have the cash to do that, um, you know you're going to be in great shape when the recession comes along. And, you know, that's what they decided like 10 years ago after the 2008 uh, recession. Well, they did buy a company because they had, they had a lot of cash then. And they did buy a company during the 2008 recession, which is now a big part of SRC. And they realized that, you know, there was going to be another one coming up and that they needed to be prepared for it. So they set a goal that when that happens we want to build up over the next 10 years, we want to build up a reserve of $125 million in cash. And that was something that they worked on every year and people were totally aware of it, what was happening. And so, you know, when this uh, pandemic came along, they were, they, they were, well, they were in fine shape. They didn't have to lay anybody off. Uh, and they were totally prepared to deal with it. Yeah, that's one of the great things that, that I heard about the great game of business when I read it is they've never laid anybody off. And then when you when you wrote about the small giants book, like all those companies listed there, they never lay anybody off. They're they're looking for those recessions so that they can invest in people, give them new opportunities, buy businesses, expand, right? Because things are cheaper. So it's it, 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 if they're well if they're well run and if they're smart. Now. There do come times when you just don't have a choice, you know, and, um, you know, you, you get into, the companies get into a situation 
where um, there's one of the companies that I wrote about in Small Giants, which um, was so, actually two companies that were so adamant about not laying anybody off that one of them went out of business and the other one almost went out of business um, because, you know, and, and it was, it was sort of, you know, admirable that they, that they believed in this principle so strongly, but ultimately it was suicidal. And, uh, um, and, and that is something that, uh, you know, if things go bad, you have to do. I mean, you know, in um, one of the companies I wrote about in Small Giants was Rhythm and Hughes. Now, Rhythm and Hughes, uh, everybody knows about Rhythm and Hughes, even if they don't know the name. Uh, you know, the movie Babe in the City or, or Life of Pi is probably their most famous thing. Life of Pi was about the boy on a boat in the middle of the ocean with a tiger. And you, you look at the movie and there's a boy on the boat in the middle of the ocean with a tiger. Now, there is not really a boy on a boat in the middle of the ocean with a tiger. That is all computer special effects. And Rhythm and Hughes is, was a company that created those computer special effects. And... Um, they they did it for the Chronicles of Narnia. You know, if you if you if you see animals, there was a time there when if ever you went to to a movie and you saw animals talking, you could almost be sure that Rhythm and Hughes was behind it. Or if you looked at an ad, uh, an advertisement, and you know a Coke ad with a the bear, the polar bears talking, that was Rhythm and Hughes. Um, well, with the Life of Pi. It was really their pièce de résistance. It was the it was the the ultimate culmination of everything they did because the ocean wasn't there, uh, the boat wasn't there, the uh, tiger wasn't there. You know, it was it was all put together, um, and they eventually won the best picture award for it for that year. They won the Best Picture Award 11 days after they had to file for Chapter 11. I remember and, reading about that. And uh, um, they... What had happened? Well, what had happened was that the... Um, um, the environment, the, the, the industry had changed. You know, they had a business model that had worked very, very well for years. But it was dependent on having all your people basically in one location, namely Hollywood. And as long as they could survive with keeping all their people in Hollywood or in the area, in that in Southern California, then um, they were okay. But then the industry changed. And more and more... Production was going out. I was going to Canada. It was going to the UK. It was going to China. It was going to all these different places. And in many cases, the it, as part of the deal where the movie studio would uh, arrange to be their filming to be in Vancouver or someplace like that. Um, part of the condition was that they had to lo use local. Um, computer special effects companies. And that really changed things. And um, so I realized that in those circumstances, it's very important for um, a business to be able to change its business model. Um, and, you know, th there's actually... Um, on, if you go to YouTube and you look up Life After Pi, um, there's a, a very touching uh, video film about what happened to Rhythm and Hughes. 
And John Hughes, who's the uh, was the CEO, he says sort of sadly, you know, I kept not wanting to lay anybody off. I didn't. I, I felt like it was my obligation to make sure that they stayed employed. And eventually, we got to the point where we had to lay everybody off. So you know, that's those are the um, the facts of business. So I wanted to wanted to ask this earlier as part of the open management um, process um, is. So there's visibility into the, the the book of business. There's visibility into essentially the runway of an organization. I, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong here, is there also salary transparency inside of there? And you were just talking about Rhythm and Hughes and then another organization that was on the brink of going under. Part of the reason I'm asking, and this has come up in the past, but in, even in recent conversations with the pandemic, but if everybody had that visibility and say, clearly our what it costs to run the business is more than we are making and more than we are paying our employees. That's not going to work. At a certain point, something is going to give. And I, right. I'm willing to bet if we presented people with that information, we would collectively probably say something like, well, let's take a pay cut. Let's find other ways to potentially keep the business going because making less today is better than making nothing. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how, how that well, kind that of happens. That okay. that happened. That 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 does happen. Uh, it happened at Zingerman's, which is one of the companies in Small Giants, where their bakery, uh, their bakehouse, which they all their businesses are run separately, and one of their businesses is called Zingerman's Bakehouse, and they were they in 2008 when 2008 hit, um, they're a very open book company. And they went to, um, everybody knew what was happening and that the sales were going down. And the leaders came to the people and said, look, this is the situation. These are our costs. This is, what what are we going to do here? And they, And people, you know, they stepped forward and said, I'll take a pay cut. Let's all take a. Actually, the the uh, leaders said that they were going to cut out their salaries entirely, and that they were going to ask other people if they'd be willing to uh, reduce their salaries. And you know, everybody was. And and if there was somebody who, for what some um, compelling reason, couldn't, then that was okay. Um, so that does happen. One of the things that I do is that there's a conference every year of all these open book companies. It's called the Gathering of Games because these are all companies that are playing the great game of business. And um, every year there's a panel, which I'm on, which chooses um, the most exemplary companies that, that are great game companies and um we get a, we get usually we get about 30 or 40 different companies uh submitting for to be chosen as all stars and um this the last year uh in the middle of the pandemic um uh i of all the companies that submitted their nominations and I'm talking about 40 or 50 companies there was one company that had laid anybody off um, and it was because of sort of what you're saying which is that uh, when everybody knows what's going on you know you you have a choice um, one of the companies the other company in the small giants in my book that got into serious trouble uh, and had to do a layoff was a company called Rayel Precision Manufacturing, and what they they are they create they were known for creating something called a constant torque hinge. Um, you know, when you have a laptop computer and you open the top of it, doesn't fall right down. That's because of a a, a constant torque 
hinge. And uh, they were by far the pioneer of constant torque hinges, and, and they were uh, supplying all the early um, laptop companies in the United States with their constant torque hinges. But then at a certain point, you know, the industry moved to Asia, and all all um, all laptops were being built in Asia, and suddenly they found themselves competing against local uh, uh, manufacturers who were making laptop hinges and could charge less for them. So they had to decide: Well, are we going to try and hold on to this business, um, which is going to mean? lowering our prices and um, they decided that they were afraid that if they didn't do that they would lose all this cash flow and they that would re- force them to have to lay people off and they did not want to do that that was against what they wanted to do so they decided to cut their prices and to compete with these other uh, manufacturers in Asia uh, on their terms, not not Rael's terms. The result was that although they continued to be the best out there and they continued to have a lot of um, uh, a lot of customers in Asia, um, they they were. They got to the point where they were they were losing money on every single laptop hinge that they made um, because they they simply couldn't charge enough to um, you know to 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 maintain the company and eventually it got to a point where they realized that they were going to lose the whole company if they didn't have a layoff and there were actually people in the company. Who said no, no, no? That's against our philosophy. We don't, we don't do that. And they said, well, do you want the whole company to go away? Um, then everybody will lose their job. And uh, so they went ahead and they did, they did do them, but they didn't do enough cutting. Finally, they brought in a new CEO who who recognized that the basic problem was that they were totally dependent on a product that would put them out of business and that the only way that they could save themselves was to start coming up with products that, um, you know, didn't have this problem um, that they could make money on. And, uh, but that takes time because they had to do that while they were, they had to invest in the R and D and the development of of these new products, while um, they were still depending on the cash flow that was coming in from the laptop hinges, so you had to sort of do it over time, where you still get that cash flow from the laptop hinges, but you you cut it back and you come up with new products, and it took it took about a year for them to do it, but the company survived and and actually came out of the whole thing, I think, stronger than ever. Because, you know, basically everybody, having been through that experience, everybody realized these. this is just the realities. This is what we have to deal with. Yeah, many of those companies and small giants tend to find, realize that they need to invest in things with high margins, right? Because right. there's lots of things they want to do as a community towards a common, some other common goal or purpose that they're involved in. And they need revenues to do those things, and and so usually they figure that out, right? Like that, at least that seemed like a common theme when I read read that book. Well, that's very perceptive, Jeff. Um, the fact is that if you're selling uh, products or services with high margins, you know you do less work. <laughs> it it uh, it's easier. You can generate the cash you need. All, you know, every for every business, cash is king. You run out of cash, you're out of business. 
Uh, this is what the dot coms didn't realize back in the day, and because they were getting cash from investors, and then when the investors decided they didn't want to give cash anymore, suddenly there was the huge the dot bomb uh, that and all these dot coms crashed, um, and so if you have a if you're service or your product is very high margin, then you're getting more cash with each sale. Now, how do you, the question is, how do you have that kind of high margin business? Well, people have got to be willing to pay for it. And um, that means your product or your service has to be so great that people will pay you a premium for it. It's got to be, and, um, you know, that's just part of, again, the realities of business, which is, you know, a lot of people don't really understand what profit is. Um, profit is, there are two ways to look at profit. I mean, there are some people who look at profit and they think, oh, this is something that um, companies sort of extract from their customers without telling them. And they're, they're just sort of, you know, taking it without ask. Uh, the other way to look at it is that profit is essentially the applause that your customers are giving you. Um, no one's forcing them to buy your products. But if they think your product is so good that they're willing to pay you more for it than what your competitors are offering. It's their way of saying, "Gee, this is really good. I like you. I like what you what your product is." And uh, you know, we see that happening all the time. Yeah, you think of you know many of the companies we talked about earlier, like Apple, for example, right? Yeah, there is a premium product that you can get something very similar from other other companies out there, but people pay a premium because of a sleek design of what it stands for. Like, there's a lot that goes behind an Apple product. Yeah. Uh, and the usability. Plus, it was, I think it was always Jobs' idea, and I think that Tim, uh, well, I think I, I think the company still follows the idea that to, to get people sort of trapped in the Apple network. You get an iPhone. You get, I mean, I'm I'm totally trapped. Of course, I don't mind it, because uh, the quality is good, but uh, you know, once you have an i an iPhone, a laptop, an iPad, and a um, smartwatch, a, maybe <laughs> a watch and, a, and an iMac or, or or whatever, you know, you're completely. And some people hate that and um, do everything they can to avoid it, which is all right. That's their prerogative. Um, but uh, it it was a decision I think that Jobs made early on, uh, and uh, it's been carried on since then. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet we talked quite a bit about you know the great game of business, but um, in the Finish Big book, um, you know one of the things you talked about a lot there was you know people selling their business and really just not being happy. And you would think, okay, I've built this huge business, probably put in tons of hours to do this, you know, maybe working 70, 80 hours a week doing this or more. I've got this big amount of money. You can do anything in the world. You've just built this company, but now you're not happy. Yeah. And, I, and, and that just doesn't seem like, I'm like, wow, that seemed really counterintuitive. But I guess I, you know, if you lose all your purpose and your sense of direction of where you're going, I can totally... I can totally get that. So, I mean, it was almost what fifty percent of the people you or companies you yeah worked people with people tell the ones I, I interviewed. It was about fifty percent of them were really unhappy. When I talk to people who who are professionals in the industry, uh, they tell me the percentage is actually much higher. Um, and uh, you know, I. Um, it, it was very it's it was very very interesting to me to see this that because you know generally everybody when they get to the point where they begin of course I think they should think about selling 
about what they're going, where they want to go with their business at a very, very early point. But most people don't. So, so in any event, when you get to the point of saying, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to let go here and move on. Uh, everybody talks about how much money they're going to get for it. And all the focus is on how much money they're going to get. And of course, you hire people to help you. And what you're hiring those people to do is to help you get as much money as you can. But the danger is, is that it draws your attention away from what's really important to us as human beings, namely our happiness. And I always, when, when, whenever I hear people talking about, uh, you know, if you do this, if you do this, you can make a lot of money on this. And I said, yes, but are you going to be happy? And that's a whole different, a whole different question. Because as you say, you know, what, what these business owners, what I found with a lot, with a lot of these business owners, not all of them, because there were some that did have, uh, happy exits, but usually the, the ones that did had something to go to that engaged all of their energies and, um, as much as their businesses had. Um, and, uh, the ones who had a hard time, as you, as you say, when you think of all the things that you lose, if you have a business for 20, 30 years and then you sell it, all the things you lose. Well, the first is, as you pointed out, you lose your identity um, and your sense of purpose. Uh, you know, people would say that uh, the, what they really hated was to go to a party and somebody would ask them, what do you do? And they would they would say, well, I, I used to have uh, a business or, well, what do you do now? And they wouldn't know how to answer it. Um, another, they, they also, you know, if, if year after year, day after day, for years and years, you go into an office and you see essentially the same group of people with people moving in and out, suddenly you don't have those people anymore. And particularly if you were the boss and everybody was sort of looking to you for your opinion about this, and then suddenly people don't return your phone calls, um, that can be extremely disorienting. The other thing is that, you know, business gives a structure to somebody's life because it tells you what is the next thing you have to do. And the, it's the business tells you that. And if you're suddenly in a situation where you could do anything, that's not necessarily, uh, I mean, at, sure, for a while you travel the world or you spend time on the beach, but after a while you get pretty bored with that. And uh, you miss the fact that um, you don't have that structure in your life some people try to create it artificially. I've heard lots of stories about this. And the other, the other thing is that business sort of tells you how you're doing, where you're going, you know, where you go from one year to the next. Oh, yeah, well, last year we were here, and at the end of this year we're here. Uh, this is the progress we've made. Well, suddenly you don't have that marker either. So all of these things that you've built your life around are gone and that can be extremely disorienting and, uh, you know, make people uh, wish they'd, gee, I wish I'd never so knew it. I did look at, uh, to see, well, what, if you look at the people who, are, well, the people who I was looking at who've had good exits, I, I would ask, well, what do they have in common? What have they done uh, differently from some of the others? And it was all, it was always the same. Um, they had found somebody else to serve. Um, you know, they had uh, they'd become advisors to other entrepreneurs. Uh, they had become uh, the kind of guides. 
to help other people sell their businesses. Um, you know, they'd taken up this, that, or the other thing. You know, I, I, I was just talking to my brother who, who was, who's at the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, he was, uh, and he ran a laboratory there and he retired from it and he decided to read Finish Big. And, uh, I, I told him, well, I hope it has some relevance to him. And, uh, you know, I, I told him, well, I said, well, his name is Will. I, I said, well, you have got a tremendous amount of knowledge that you have built up over an entire lifetime. You've struggled with things. You've come up with answers to things, you know. You have you have got this incredible uh, reservoir of stuff that you know that other people are, are struggling with right now, and um, you know if you can find a way to make that available to other people. You're doing a tremendous service, and um, you know something you can really be proud of, and uh, it, it, it does have the effect of also giving you a sense of purpose and an identity that, to some extent, we all need, um, and uh, so. Yeah, just like a business wants to provide value to its customers, a person wants to provide value to somebody, right? And right. Other people, or whether that's internally in a business or to their customers, like everybody wants to feel that. So, how do you use your skills to do that? Right. Absolutely. So you got I, it. I, I'm curious though, because I don't know. Maybe maybe this is just crazy talk here, but like I find it a little bit depressing. Like we use that <laughs> word purpose, and I think we're using it properly, but like. A job is not a purpose. And I find it a little bit depressing that we as a society feel like I need to go to a job to have purpose in life. Well, I, uh, I feel like we missed something there if, we, if we're supplementing purpose with a job. Well, here's the thing. A really, the companies I write about, the really well-run companies, they do have a purpose. And they include everybody else who works for them in that purpose. They're, they're accomplishing something that's much bigger. It's bigger than them. And, um, they, uh, and, 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 and if they, if they do a, an effective job of managing their companies, then the people in those companies, um, have that same sense of purpose. Um, they, they realize that what they're doing is important. It's important in the world. And that uh, by doing what they're doing, uh, whatever the job may be, they're helping other people um, uh, do what they need to do. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're providing a product or service that somebody else uh, values and values enough to pay for. Um, and um, that's really what you hit on, Jeff, is the difference between a well-run company and a poorly run company. A poorly run company, the people who work there will feel, well, this is just a job. You know, this is getting me my... Um, what I need so that I can go out and do the things I like to do. You know, um, I have this job because I need money and, uh, uh, because it, it's not what I want to do, but, uh, it's not something I would do on my, myself, but, uh, something I have to do if I'm going to have the money to do the things I want to do. Well, you know, that is depressing. And that is sad. I mean, and I, when I'm talking to younger people, um, 
which is pretty much everybody these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I really advise them to, to, to do something, to find something to do that really feels worthwhile to them. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, uh, Jim Collins and Good to Great in his various books. And he has, he has this, uh, I, I forget what he calls it, but it, it, it's sort of like a triangle. Um, what can you make money at? What can you do better than anybody else in the world? And uh, what does the world need? Um, I don't know. Is that is that it? Do I have that right? I think those I think those those sound right for him. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Yeah. Um. I have a, I have his book right over here, but I <laughs> I don't I don't want to take time right now to look it up. But it 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 it's really there's a real element of wisdom in that. Um, yeah, it's he calls it the hedgehog concept. It's, that's it. That's the hedgehog. Yep. Yeah. What are you deeply passionate about? Uh, what are what, what are you the you best make, in the world? What, what, what are you the what, best? In? Yeah, you and go. Then what, and then uh, what drives your economic engine? Yeah. You know? yep, yeah. Those are the three things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, this was a really great conversation, Bo. We really I, I've enjoyed learned, it. We really loved learning from you and hearing all your stories, um, or many of your stories. You have so many. Um, is there, at this time, is there anything you want to plug or promote to our listeners? Well, there is an organization that I've been working with. Well, there's an organization called the Small Giants Community, which is really people who read, have read Small Giants and uh, say, you know, that's the kind of company I want to build, and uh, or they say that's the company kind of company I have, and uh, there are people who uh, actually friends of mine and and people I work with. Uh, really two people in particular, Paul Spiegelman and Hemza Daher, um, who have sort of created this community of people who sort of are really um, trying to create more of these sort of purpose-driven companies. And who they, they and so, so, so that's one organization. I'm also involved with the, uh, the Great Game of Business, which has another organization. Um, and and then there's another one, which is actually has to do with a book that I'm working on right now. It's called the Tugboat Institute. And it, it is uh, made of companies that its founder refers to as evergreen companies. And that is companies that are built to last and last and last forever um there's one company in in the uh uh in the uh tugboat institute that has been around in the same family uh continuously since 1728 it was uh, chartered uh in the massachusetts bay colony by george ii of england um and um these companies they they have a lot in common with the small giants the difference is that a lot of them are not small at all some of them are really really big companies uh but they 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 operate according to seven principles that they have one is purpose they all have a purpose Another one is people first. Um, another one is profit. Profit as a measure of how your customers, how much your customers love you. Um, another another one is uh, pace growth. Uh, 
that is they they're not trying to get real big real fast um and they're did they say they're private they're all private companies not public um and um they they all uh have a certain way of going about innovation which is sort of different from what you would find in silicon valley and uh actually the irony is that the person who um really is the founder of this company was uh, a dyed in the wool venture capitalist which is sort of the opposite of of these you know cuz venture capital venture companies that are that have private equity or venture capital in them the whole idea is that uh, they're going to get sold at some point and or go public which is just saying so, sold to the public so that uh, to to get the cash required to pay off the investors in the funds and th- this is really the opposite of that and uh yet he was uh, he was a client of Perkins and uh he was very involved in uh, uh the financing of Amazon and Google and so forth um so for him to have undergone this change in his perspective uh is really sort of like a religious conversion um so that's the book i'm writing with him and uh if people uh haven't heard about it i guess most people probably haven't i would urge you to check out the website for the tugboat institute cool that's that's great well thanks for coming on and well, thank um, you guys very much